have about 24 questions. So for those of you who might be joining me for the first time, at the end of every um, Neighborhood Services HOA Academy, virtual HOA Academy, we answer every question that has been submitted throughout the class. Um, and so today we have 24 questions. The first question is, boards and management company doesn't respond to co-owner requests for vendors contracts or four formal email requests made for three months. No responses or acknowledgement of request. What is the recourse for um, owners? Okay, so basically make sure you're document, documenting in writing that you're requesting these records. Um, and apparently they don't wanna give the vendor contract. I think it's probably what's going on here. What you can do is when you make your records request, what you may wanna do is say, um, I understand that um, you know you can redact the compensation of, of the contractor and you're welcome to do that on the contract I'm requesting, but I wanna see the actual terms of the contract. Um, tell them that you've made you know, all these requests. If you don't respond, um, you can either file a lawsuit against them in Superior Court, or you can go to the Arizona Department of Real Estate and file a complaint um, against the association. And then there will be a hearing with an administrative law judge. If you want more information on that complaint process, um, you just Google Arizona Department of Real Estate and HOA and condo disputes, and the whole process will come up um, if you click on the link. Okay, can an HOA charge a 1% transfer fee when selling a condo? If yes, how? Okay, great, we have a cheat sheet on this exact topic. Um, it's called Disclosure and Transfer Fees. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at this. We're gonna be sharing it on Zoom and Facebook Live here right now. Um, the bottom line is yes, they can charge this, but they have to comply with the requirements under Arizona law. And it has to be in the CCNRs and there's um, a very specific way that it needs to be written. So unless your association has that specific language in your CCNRs allowing you to do this, it may not be enforceable. Okay, question number three. What hanging signage around a private condominium complex? Oh, when hanging signage around a private condominium complex, is it prudent to use both English and Spanish language? Um, I guess it really just depends on the demographics in your association. And has there been a request for, um, you know, the signage to be in English and Spanish? Um, some associations do it. I would say it's kind of irregular though. I mean, I think it's more likely than not, most of the signs are in English, but some associations also have, you know, the Spanish signs because they want everybody to know what the rules are. Um, and if you have a large Spanish speaking demographic, that might be a good idea for your community. So it's prudent if you have a large demographic and your board's okay with that. Okay, next question. Have you ever heard of someone trying to change a plat map of an association? Is that something that is even possible to do? Um, yes, I have. Um, in fact, our firm has helped uh, a number of associations over the years amend the plat. Um, it's not easy to do, but it can be done. Um, it requires a vote of the membership. Um, typically, it's the same vote that's the amendment provision in your CCNRs. Um, and you also have to go through, um, you may need, depending on what the amendment is, you may need to use an engineering company to recreate the plat map. And you likely will also need to go through, um, you know, approval from whatever city approved the original plat map. Question number five, if a board member still owns a home in an HOA, but is living in another area, can they still participate in board votes and be on the board? So yes, um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a law that was passed by the Arizona legislature that said it, you cannot make a requirement to be on the board um, that you live on the property. So, um, you know, even as long as they you know, own a home in the property and they're the record owner, um, they still can serve on the board. Um, and again, this would be a good question for our blog to the, for our, our firm. And uh, I know my team's listening to this here today. So I would recommend that we, we do that because that's a, a good question that comes up often. Okay, number six, where is the plat map located? How can association members obtain a copy or view the plat map? So the best way to do it, the best way to find it, um, it's listed on the Maricopa County Recorder's Office. If you live in Maricopa County or whatever county recorder that you live in, um, you know, 
a couple different ways you can do it. Um, the way I do it, to be perfectly honest with you, is I go to uh, the assessor's office, Maricopa County Assessor's Office, and I type in the address of an owner for the property. And um, once the owner's information comes up, um, there's an area that shows the plat map that's associated with that property. I click on that and then it automatically directs you to the recorder's office. You can use a title company to get the plat map if that you can't get it, you know, if you're unsuccessful in figuring that out. You can go to the recorder's office website and look up by the association's name too. Um, so where is it located? It's always recorded with the county recorder's office. You can obtain a copy of it um, through clicking on a link at the assessor's office for a property that's located in the association. You can go to the county recorder's office to get it, or you can have a title company get it for you. Okay, number seven, can the board create landscape rules without homeowner input or architectural committee input? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there's a weird tension between the board and typically the architectural committee. And um, it's just a weird thing that I've noticed over the years. Try not to be that way if you can, um, because we're all a team. And when you're, you know, volunteering either as a board member or as a committee member, um, <clears throat> we're all working together. So, I mean, I think it would be smart for the board to let the architectural committee know that they're thinking about making these changes and get their feedback, um, you know, but they aren't technically required to do so. Um, and so, you know, can the board create it? Yes, they can create landscaping rules without the input, but is it a good idea? No. Best practices would be to have everybody at the table, um, including the owners, have publicized that you're thinking about changing it and get their feedback too. Okay, question eight. We had a board that had an issue with a vendor. The vendor placed a lien on all of our homes. Should we have been protected against this by the Articles of Incorporation? Okay, so this sometimes happens. Um, you know, there's construction liens that are placed on properties when the association is engaging in a large construction project. And so it may have been unavoidable. So sometimes um, when there's a large construction pro project that the association's working on, um, as protections for the contractor to get paid, um, they will, you know, send you a copy of a lien. Um, and the lien is, and the association a copy of the lien, and the lien is their protection in the case that the association doesn't pay. Now, I've seen this come up in weird situations where maybe like the developer didn't pay their contractors while they were in control of the board, and then they left, and then, you know, the contractor's coming back to get paid and trying to exercise their rights under the lien. Um, and so I guess the question is, um, you know, should we have been protected as owners against this? I mean, if it's if it's the standard lien that's done before a large construction project, there is nothing really that the board can do about it. It's you know it's a pre lien. It's not even you know recorded. Um, if it's the type of lien that actually gets recorded because the board or the developer didn't pay some a bill, then yes, you should have been protected. That is unusual and that should not have happened. Um, and you know, you need to go to your board and say, you need to rectify this immediately. Um, and it, to me, would be a sign that the, your board is not acting appropriately or that they don't have the funds or whatever. There might be a backstory on it or they don't know what to do because it's a developer expense. Um, so your board should be talking with their attorney to figure out what the best plan is here. Okay, um, next question, um, question number nine. Our previous board members neglected the perimeter walls for numerous years. We, the current board, decided to paint and walk the walls and found stucco cracks and erosion which caused the exposure of the bare block below original grade level. We received estimates of $11,000 to repair this. The plat states the HOA has the responsibility of maintenance of perimeter walls. Our attorney states that we can ch charge the owner homeowners instead of taking it out of reserve or funds. Wouldn't we be asking for trouble or a lawsuit if we do this? This is one of those where I really need to kind of look at all the documents um, and to know more about the facts. Um, but if 
the association has a responsibility for maintenance of it, you know, at first glance. I don't do not think that you can, you know, force owners to repair, whatever, maintain the perimeter walls. Um, but there are exceptions to that. Like, for example, maybe this wall isn't a perimeter wall. Maybe this is like a party wall between, um, you know, two areas. And it's not the definition of a perimeter wall. Or maybe the owner overwatered and created the, you know, the cracks and the erosion issue. And they're at fault. And because of that, you know, we have a contractor that says, hey, they caused this. And there's a provision in the documents that says if you damage something as an owner, you're responsible for it. So I don't know all the facts on this one. So it's hard for me to comment on it. Um, but you definitely should ask some of the questions that I raised here today um, to your board and your board's attorney. Okay, question number 10. How long does the corporation have to respond to document requests and other information? So once it's placed in writing the records request, you have 10 business days to respond with the documents to the owner. Okay, question number 11. We have a large number of units owned by LLCs as rental units. When holding votes, right now we are attempting to amend our CCNRs, are the LLCs given voting rights? So yes, they are. Um, they're given voting rights just as any other owner would be. Um, you're just gonna wanna make sure that the manager of the LLC is the person that's voting um, in the, on the amendment. And you can find out who the manager is of a corporation or an LLC manager of an LLC or if it's a corporation, um, you know, a shareholder or director of the corporation um, by going to the Arizona Corporation Commission and looking up the name of the entity and it'll be listed right there um, who the manager or the director is for that association or for that um, particular LLC or corporation. And then that person should be allowed to vote. Okay, next question, number 12. Can a board make a rule or guideline that is not supported by the CCNRs regarding the Architectural Control Committee? Specifically, can the board suddenly decide that they are going to charge a $10,000 deposit for any major reconstruction? For the past 30 years, there was never a construction deposit required. Um, we have a cheat sheet that talks about this um, that I would like you to take a peek at. Um, it's on the Architectural Control Committee, um, and you should look at that because the law was amended several years ago um, talking about new construction and what the board, um, you know, the specific procedure that the board can follow regarding new construction properties and the type of deposits that they can charge. Um, but generally speaking, um, this is really something that needs to be in the CCNRs. Um, so I need to know more about the specific rule that they have put in place. Um, and I'd need to see your CCNRs to see if maybe it gives the board the authority to do this, but maybe doesn't list the amount. So um, it's hard for me to comment on this without actually seeing more information. But it's possible that in light of, you know, the legislation that was passed, um, that they are, you know, now implementing a deposit. Um, but I, I want to see what your documents say about this. Okay, question number 13. If language is not included in our CCNRs to restrict smoking on patios, can we add it to the rules and regulations? You know, it really depends on how broad your rulemaking authority is for your association. So, and are the patios considered limited common elements? Um, you know, it sounds like possibly you're a condominium or a townhome. Um, and so I think it's likely you're able to do this, but you need to have um, something in your documents that would support this. Um, you know, and so broad rulemaking authority would be number one, and then, you know, implement the correct language in the actual rules by a vote of membership, excuse me, by a vote of the board of directors. Um, typically, it's going to be the entity that can amend the, the rules and regulations. Okay, um, next question, number 14. Our board has been having weekly board of directors working group meetings. The meetings are posted and minutes are taken. Recently, it was decided that we could vote on issues and share the results at the next monthly meeting. Is this ethical? Okay, it really just depends. Um, you know, you're saying that your meetings are posted. So if the meetings are posted 48 hours in advance of the meeting, and you're taking minutes and owners are getting an agenda, which is a requirement to have an open meeting um, when they come to the meeting or before the meeting, um, you know, that's 
that's fine. Um, but you need to define it in the, you know, the meeting notice that, hey, this is the board of directors working group and we'll be discussing items, but we also vote on issues um, at this board of directors working group. Okay, next question. Um, number 15, how much does it generally cost to update our CCNRs and bylaws? Also, if they are updates, do the updated CCNRs require an approval vote of the community like an amendment, or can the board just approve the new documents? Okay, so how much does it generally cost to update the CCNRs and bylaws? This is a really great question to lead into something that our firm offers. Um, which is a free 15 minute review of any of your documents that you want us to review. Um, we will you know, look at all of them at once. We'll spend 15 minutes on it for free. And then we'll give you what our very quick general ideas are on how to amend them and what the amendment requirements are. So what percentage you need. And then we'll also give you a, a bid for approximately how much it's gonna cost to amend your CCNR. So, I can't give you a general, you know, I've seen some that are as low as 1,000. I've seen some that are as high as 10,000. Um, it really just depends on a number of different factors, how old they are, how long they are, how many changes need to be done, how structurally they're set up, are they set up well, are they not set up well, um, how many back and forth, you know, meetings do I have with the board on the amendment, all of these things will factor into the total cost. Um, and do updated CCNRs require a membership vote? We have to look at the documents um, to determine, um, but 99.99% you are going to need a vote of the membership in order to amend your CCNRs. Okay, question 16. Are HOA records available to all members to see and are copies of these documents free? The management copy billed me for copies of last year's tax returns at 15 cents a page. So it's free for you to view them. You know, if you just go in and look at the document, the original, but if they, if you ask for a copy, it's 15 cents per page under state law. So your management company was correct in handling it that way, as long as you've got the copy of the document. Okay, question number 17. How does a planned development district relate to the plat for a particular subdivision? Hmm. I'd have to look at the plat for your particular association. Um, and I'm not quite sure what you mean by planned area development district. Um, I'm assuming some associations have, you know, they, they're set up by the developer and approved by the city in a certain way. And I'm guessing you're one of those where it's like a district um, and, you know, but without seeing the specifics of your association, I'm sorry, I can't comment on this one. Um, if you email me offline, um, I'll take a look at it for you, okay? Okay, next question, number 18. Our governing documents are 25 years old, 25 plus years old. We have begun the process of amending all of them, but started only with the articles of incorporation presented to the owners. Our articles require 75% approval by the owners for amendments by a written consent, not a vote. We have not made such headway in getting approvals we have not made much headway in getting approval since April. We've written two letters to owners explaining why amendments are necessary. For example, to eliminate obsolete developer language. We've explained specifically that any changes to the articles do not affect the CCNRs. Can you suggest a way to overcome apathy or resistance to the changes? Well, a couple things. I think that you should I mean, it looks like you sent the documents out, um, you know, in April, it's July. I mean, I would probably do about every, a reminder every week or every two weeks that people need to vote on it and that we will continue to contact you until there's a vote by you on this. That's one way to handle it. Um, also talk about it at your annual meeting, um, you know, add it to the ballot for your annual meeting. Um, so when they're voting for candidates, they also, you know, vote on this if they haven't voted already. Um, you know, phone calls, having a coffee at the park um, where we ask people to come or maybe have like a community bonding event and have the, the ballots there or the, or the, you know, the written consents there so people can vote on it. I mean, you really do have to get creative. You're in that step four, you're between four and five, but 
I'm not sure how much strategy you had in step four to get that 75% approval. Like I would, you know, I would have already mapped it out saying, okay, it's going to be hard to get 75% approval. This is hard. That's a high number. So every week we're going to send an email to those who haven't voted. And every month we're going to break out the people that haven't voted. And we're going to, as a board, we're going to divide up the names and we're going to call the people who haven't voted. Um, and we're going to have a social event at the park and we're going to bring the, you know, the, the written consents to that. And anybody who hasn't voted, if we see them there, we're going to track them down and get them to vote. Um, you know, these are all different examples of how to get the votes. But the key thing is squeaky wheel gets it done. You got to just it's blood, sweat and tears at the end. To try to get these votes. You have to just continue to contact them and let them know we're going to continue to contact you until you vote yes or no on this. Okay, next question, um, number 19. In the past, I think you've said that there are a number of practical provisions you believe should be considered when amending CCNRs, like prohibiting a husband and wife from serving on the board concurrently. Can you discuss your most common suggestions? Um, hmm. You know, I need like an hour to do that. <laughs> Um, but the probably the most, okay, of course, yes, the example you gave, it's never a good idea to have a husband and wife serving on the board at the same time. Um, that would be a good practical one. Um, some other ones would be when we're making changes to the, like, the law for an amendment to the CCNRs per se or an amendment to the bylaws. Um, I've been putting a provision in there that says that any time the Arizona legislature amends, you know, any law that conflicts with this document, that the board can automatically record an amendment bringing the document into compliance with the changes in the law. That's probably the best one because that gives you bulletproof for the future. You don't have to go back and get membership approvals for these future amendments that happen um, or future law changes that happen. You can just go ahead and the board can just go ahead and do it. So I think that's probably the biggest practical one that I can talk about. Um, and another few ones I can think of would be like, if your annual meeting is like honed into like one day each year, you have to have it on the first Monday of February at 9 PM or whatever. I mean, I think we all can recognize that that hasn't always been followed in an association for a number of reasons. Um, and so changing that to make it more lenient that you just have to have it within the fiscal year. Okay, next question. Um, this question is related to the Callway case that we talked about in the presentation. Um, Callway versus Calabria Ranch. If an association documents prohibit the association giving any HOA funds to a third party, is it foreseeable that an amendment could allow the association to give funds from the HOA dues and assessments to a third party that is a for-profit corporation under the general amendment provision? Hmm. Probably not, actually. Um, but I don't know enough about the facts. Like, um, you know, are you like acquiring land or are you, is this like a contract type of thing? I, I'm not sure I really understand where you're going on this. So you're paying a third party. Um, you can't give HOA funds to a third party. I'm not even sure that that was quoted properly for what your documents say. Um, you know, because typically you do give money to a third party. You pay all your vendors, et cetera. So I, I'm going to have to pass on this question. Email me with clarification because I don't understand what you're asking. Um, okay, next question, number 20. 21, sorry. Um, you designate a community as a planned community versus an HOA, which sometimes follows different rules. I live in what I imagine is under a planned community. Is it the size or what are the parameters? Okay, so great question. Sorry, I didn't clarify that sooner. So Arizona law defines whether you're a planned community or a condominium. Um, if you're a condominium, and one of the kind of the easiest ways to do it um, and we have a deep dive on this, on the cheat sheet that we shared in this presentation on what is an association. It defines what's the difference between a condo and a planned community from a legal perspective. Okay, in a condo, from a legal perspective, the owners own a percentage interest in the common areas. If you look at your deed and it says you own unit two 
and one forty ninth of the common areas, you are a condo. Another place to look in the CCNRs if it says that the common areas or the common elements of the association are owned, you know, in per- percentage by the owners in percentage, you know, based upon their ownership, then your condo. A planned community, on the other hand, the common areas are owned by the association's board of directors or the association. Condo, the owners own a percentage interest in the common areas. Planned community, the association owns the common areas and we get taxed on the common areas. We get tax bill for the property. Um, That's probably the simplest way to, that's the way I do it typically. Occasionally, it's confusing. Like it'll say one thing like that the, sometimes it'll have both, like, and you're not quite sure what it is. Um, And that's when you need to escalate it to an attorney to determine, help you determine which one it is. Okay, number 22, does step four in our amendment process have to occur in an open meeting session? Um, yes, unless your attorney is present or unless your attorney is giving you advice on this and it falls under the category, you know, advice from your legal counsel that you could push it to executive session. Um, number 23, does your five-step plan vary when elective voting is used? Um, no, doesn't. Most of our clients actually now are using electric voting, um, whether owners are returning the ballot by email or sometimes we're using a company like HOA Vote now and they just handle the whole balloting for an association. So no, it doesn't change. Um, you know, step four or five doesn't change. It's just part of the strategy process that, okay, we're going to be collecting the ballots this way, or we're going to be giving the owners the opportunity to vote you know, electronically by email or maybe through a company, a third party company to help us with the vote. Okay, um, can we charge 15 cents for electronic copies? That is the question of the day, right? Um, I gave my example that I personally do not charge for that. Um, when I am given an email, um, you know, and I forward copies of documents by email and I forward it to the homeowner by email, I don't charge for it. Um, you know, I think from a practical perspective, if you're handing them a actual copy, a physical copy, then I would charge them for it. If it's electronic, I think you're in a gray area and I don't think you win if this goes to court. Um, another thing that I just want to mention, cause I've had this come up a few times, um, you know, over the years is that somebody comes to my office, let's say to do a records review. Um, they're an owner, they've requested records. The board's asked me to meet with the owner to, you know, make sure they don't steal the records, frankly, if we put them in a conference room, you know, and the owner sits in there and takes pictures using their phone of the records. And my client is typically going absolutely berserk because they don't want them doing that. Um, You know, if there's a protocol for, um, you know, records reviews when they're only reviewing the records and they're not asking for copies, that needs to be established before you go into the room with the owner. And so if the protocol is, and this should be voted on in a board meeting, no phones, um, you know, no copy machines can be brought in, et cetera. You need to tell them that upfront, you know, when you tell them where they can come to review the records, make sure you make that clear. And the board should be, you know, have that as a policy that's been voted on in an open board meeting, if that's what you want. Um, then the follow-up question on this is what about for 300 pages of electronic copies? Well, I mean, there's no requirement that you, you know, have to send it electronically. Um, as a matter of fact, somebody who's requesting 300 pages, I wouldn't make it that easy for them because that's like a really large records request. I probably would just print it out and tell them they can pick it up and charge them 15 cents per page on that. Um, I have a funny story. I have very little time. We're almost to the conclusion of I do. I do kind of like to tell the story because it really is hilarious. So earlier in my career, I was helping an association do a records request for a very difficult owner in the community. And um, this particular owner was also kind of odd, truth be told. And um, so we had somebody in our office watching the person in our conference room. We have a glass conference room at that time and, and a glass door. And so we had the position just so that we could watch them as they were going through the documents. And um, my office called back to me and said, I think the 
person who is in there for the records request just put one of the documents in his pants. <laughs> what should I do? And I said, well, I'll be down. I'll come down to the conference room and I'll talk with them. And, um, you know, so I said to the person, you know, we have, you know, somebody watching you and they told me that you put the document in your pants and um, you can't do that. Obviously, these are the originals. If you want a copy of it, I'm happy to make a copy of it for 15 cents per page. And I'm going to give you, you know, like three minutes to turn around and get it out and put it on the table or, um, you know, I'm going to call the police. And so hilarious, the guy, you know, he said, oh, I didn't do that. It's not in my pants, and, you know, whatever. And then the next thing I knew, he turned around, got it out of his pants and put it back on the table. Um, and so you really do have to watch. Um, it was actually hilarious at the time. Um, and he didn't stay much longer either. Truth be told, he got out of there quick. So I must have, you know, um, embarrassed him by making him do that. But um, watch the documents. If you are in a, if somebody's coming into the management company's office or to the board's, you know, clubhouse or to your attorney's office to review the records, you know, it is possible that you're going to be involved in litigation on this. And if they lift something and take our original document, we don't have it anymore. Um, and so you really do need to have somebody kind of babysitting, watching what's going on to make sure that they're not stealing original documents. So, Okay, that's it for today. Um, just a few concluding remarks. Um, a few things to mention. Um, we had 127 live viewers on Zoom today um, for this seminar, which is awesome. I think it's like one of our highest uh, participation events. So thanks for being here today. We had many others joining us on Zoom. So we probably our numbers are more like 150. Um, a couple of reminders. Don't forget about that free review that we talked about. Um, we spent some time today talking about amendments to CCNRs. Don't forget that our firm offers the um, free 15 minute review of your CCNRs, bylaws, or articles. Um, and, you know, send me an email with the document that you want me to review and give us a couple of weeks to review it. And then we'll get it back to you at no charge with um, our suggestions on the amendment, what it takes to amend. Um, your documents, what percentage, and then an estimate as to how much it costs to amend the documents. Um, that's a really great free service that we're doing, um, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, the next thing I want to remind you of is that we have our next virtual First Friday free call-in on Friday, August 4th at 9 a.m. Um, we do this every month, and I get online on Zoom and Facebook Live and answer your questions for free. We just ask that it's just one question per association, um, and you can submit your questions through 8.45 a.m. on Friday, August 4th, and you can find out more information on this um, on, by contacting uh, me by email or um, by um, contacting our office at 602-241-1093. Um, or signing up to receive our Mulcahy memos, which we send out every week with important information on associations. Okay, next we have our August class for our HOA uh, condo virtual HOA Academy, and that's going to be on Tuesday, August 15th, um, 2023. The topic for this class is going to be thoughtful hiring avoids firing. Um, in this class, we're gonna talk about management companies and how to select a management company. Um, and the important role of the community manager and how to work well with vendors, whether it's your management company or your landscaping company, and how to handle disputes um, with your vendors. Um, and so we're going to kind of all things vendors. Um, we're going to talk about how to hire them and make good choices. How do you deal with them if you have problems? How do you fire them? How do you find a new one? Um, and so we've got a lot of great topics for that um, Tuesday, August 15th class um, of our virtual HOA Condo Academy. Last but not least, it's so important for me to receive feedback as to how we can improve on these classes or if we're doing a good job. Um, and so I'm asking you, please take some time today, um, right after this class, do it now. I'm a do it now person. Please consider leaving our firm a Google review. Um, we're going to be sharing a link in the chat on how to leave a review. We are always happy to get feedback from our anybody who's listening to us here today, participating, and also from our clients about how we can continue to improve our service and how we can continue to um, provide good education and practical education for you. 
Um, the only way I'm getting feedback is if you put something on Google for me and we'll, we read every single one. So I'm encouraging you please to do that um, to help us out. Um, thank you again, everybody, for being here today. Um, we appreciate you caring about your communities and wanting to make them better. And um, I hope you have a great rest of the month. Stay cool as the temperatures get up there. Stay hydrated. And we look forward to seeing you for our classes in August. Take care, everybody.